Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, this is our second great public lecture of this academic year. And we would like to have welcome you to our virtual Glasgow. As we all know, unfortunately, due to COVID restrictions, we cannot hold this event in a face-to-face -face setting. But we at least can give you a, a flavor of our humanities uh, lecture theater, as you see or have seen in this, on this slide, which is where we usually hold these lectures. Uh, my name is Luis Porangaba. I am a lecturer in intellectual property law and the director of the intellectual LLM in intellectual property and digital economy at the University of Glasgow. I will be the chair today. I am also joined by Professor Martin Kretschmer, who is the chair of intellectual property at Glasgow and also director of the CREATE Center. I am very pleased to introduce Eleanor Sharpston. Uh, I believe that most, if not all of us, are familiar with her work at the Court of Justice. She was an advocate general, general at the European Court for a number of years from 2006 to 2020, having made a substantial contribution to EU law and also giving a, a few opinions in intellectual property law matters. Today, we have a very interesting topic. Can those European judges think for themselves why the Court of Justice of the European Union has advocate generals? So this has a more of an institutional flavor and I could not think of anyone better to uh, give this talk than uh, Eleanor Sharpston herself. Uh, just I should mention uh, that uh, Eleanor Sharpton also has an honorary doctorate from the University of Glasgow, which was awarded in 2010. Having said that, I, I give the word, I give the floor to uh, Eleanor Sharpton. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, may I begin by saying that I'm extremely happy and proud that the first honorary doctorate that I ever got from anywhere was indeed from Glasgow. And I regret that I am only with you virtually this evening. I have done my best by putting around my neck the tartan to which by marriage I'm entitled, because I'm Scots by marriage, uh, to try to, as it were, locate myself virtually in Glasgow. But it's a poor substitute for being able actually to come to your fine city and be personally present in the university again. Now, I deliberately chose a, a slightly provocative title for this evening. Actually, the title is derived from a question that a student once asked me at the end of a lecture, not very long after I joined the court as an AG. And uh, the lecture wasn't about this at all. And we were looking for questions and there weren't any questions. You know that terrible pause where you can come on somebody ask a question. And eventually somebody did put their hand up. So I smiled encouragingly. And they said, well, it's not actually what you were talking about, but can't those European judges think for themselves? Why do you guys exist? And it was a slightly unusual question perhaps, but it seemed to be a perfectly fair question. It's a fair question if you're coming from a particular perspective, which is the, UK perspective, where we know that our judges are always very senior practitioners. Sometimes they're senior academics, more often perhaps they are senior barristers, senior solicitors, people who've been out there on the street for 20, 25, 30 years, old and bold. They've seen it all. They've seen the dirty tricks that you try and pull. They know all of them. They've probably been doing them more often than the fresh faced people in front of them. And so our norm is that we have very senior judges and we are used to them giving individual judgments. And when they sit in a collective bench, they may or may not agree with the majority. If they agree with the majority, they sometimes confuse everyone by delivering a different speech, which explains why they agree with the majority. And uh, if they don't agree, then they do a very robust dissent. 
and that usually has got a lot of bite to it. And you know, if that's your norm, you can indeed ask the question, well, can't those European judges think for themselves? Why on earth do we have an AG's opinion? Why don't we just have the judgment? Well, normal is what you're used to. And if we look at the original six member states who started the club, who started first the Coal and Steel Club and then the EEC Club, of those original six, three, that is France, Belgium and the Netherlands, had something like an advocate general in their top administrative court. That is to say, they had somebody of the same status as the judges, who's a member of the court, but who presented a view of the case to the court as a separate element in the procedure before the judges got on with deliberation. And given that three out of six had such a system, it was reasonably natural, reasonably normal, I suggest to you, when they set up a new system and a new court to say, well, how about having advocates general? Yes, yeah, yeah, good idea, let's have advocates general. Well, that maybe tells you why there were advocates general to start with, but it doesn't really take you that far in answering the question, why are there still advocates general? So I want to stand back a bit and look not at the court of 1952 or 1957, but to look at the court of 2021. Why do we have advocates general in the court of today? I'd like to start by pointing out that the Court of Justice of the European Union is probably unlike any other Supreme Court you're going to come across. And I want to begin by stressing how disparate are the strands that make it up. There is a multiplicity of different legal tradition in there the full range of the variety of the member states, from the common law through various civilian traditions, through to other ones which are really very difficult to categorize. If you start trying to classify exactly what's going on with some of the Central and Eastern European member states, you have strands that go back to the Soviet period, strands that are before that, new adaptations, you know, you really have a mixture of what's of different ways of legal thinking. You have, of course, the common law civilian split, but within the civilian tradition, you have a number of different strands. And you have a splendidly multilingual setting as well. When colleagues of mine from the translation or the interpretation services of the court try to describe what's going on, they tend to use the image of an hourglass as a sort of handy shorthand to explain the system. At the top, you have all the languages of procedure, all 24 languages of procedure. Everything then goes down through a very narrow little neck which is the language of the house, unofficial of course, it's not more important than any other language, but there is one language of the house and that language for historical reasons is French, not English. The Brits weren't there at the start of the story and French was a very useful and familiar language in the original six member EEC and French it has remained at the court as the standard language. The other institutions have abandoned French in favor of English, sometimes German in some sub parts, but very more standardly use of English. International English, not the language of Shakespeare, but never mind, uh, a sort of English. But at the court, it's French. So at the neck of the hourglass, the language is 
French. Again, not uh, Le Francais de Voltaire, de Molière, de Corneille, de Racine, or even of the Académie Française. It is court administrative French, which is its own slightly weird and wonderful self. And then once the thinking, the deliberating, the writing, everything has happened, has finished, we have a judgment, then we go back out to the other half of the hourglass because everything that used to be in 24 languages at the beginning of the story, we now have to go back to a 24 language situation for the judgment at the end of the story. So, splendidly multilingual. Now let's look at what the court's actually dealing with. Three categories of cases. It's dealing with appeals from the general court. It's dealing with direct actions, by which I mean cases that are brought by the commission against a member state or by a member state against an EU institution, sometimes by one member state against another, right? And also, of course, in the most important category, I think, in the eyes of the court, the references from the national courts. Now, let's just think for a moment about the Court of Justice and compare that with a Supreme Court in a national legal system. Within a national legal system, the Supreme Court is at the apex of a triangle. So any case starts off at a first instance court, unless there's some special leapfrog arrangement, it goes up through a court of appeal before it ever gets to the Supreme Court. And not, of course, every case gets to the Supreme Court. But what that means is that within a national legal system, by the time the case does get to the Supreme Court, it has been chewed over by a number of judicial minds. I mean, whether they were right or wrong, a number of judges have had a go at that case and they have applied a judicial analysis to it. They've said, as far as we're concerned, it raises the following issues and they have tried to fill it, it and explain how the issues fit together and explain the conclusion to which one should come and why one should arrive at that conclusion. If you look at the Court of Justice, it doesn't look like that at all. For direct actions, it's the only court that's looking at the case. The direct action commission against Bulgaria to pick a member state entirely at random doesn't go somewhere first and then come on to the Court of Justice. It starts and ends in front of the court. A reference from a national court, it's perfectly true, started in a national court. But at the risk of betraying half my ancestry and being very, very Irish, sure, if the national court had known the answer to the question, sure, it wouldn't have made the reference. References are only made because Actually, a national court has a doubt as to what the answer is. I say that if it's a case of a validity query, the national court, if it has no doubt that the EU measure is valid, doesn't have to make a reference. But if the national court does entertain doubts as to the validity, the Photofrost ruling has told us for some time now that the national court must make a ruling to the ECJ. So for those two categories of case, although the Court of Justice of the European Union, the CJEU or the ECJ in English shorthand speak, is the Supreme Court, it's not the Supreme Court balanced at the apex of a triangle. It's a one-stop Supreme Court. Now you will say to me, and you'll be right to say to me, yes, but the third category is the category of the appeals from the general court, to which I will reply, you're absolutely right. And interestingly, it is less frequent 
to have an advocate general's opinion in appeals cases than it is to have an advocate general's opinion in other cases. There is usually an extremely lengthy, careful, comprehensive judgment of the general court that has been appealed. And unless what is at issue is some very new point of law, think something like Cardi 1, or unless there is an obvious divergence, a difficulty, some inconsistent strands in the case law, which need to be sorted out, there will be a tendency to think that it's not necessary to have an advocate general's opinion as well. <clears throat> so let's also, just to set the scene, let's also remember that in the CJU, we have a single consensus judgment. We have a judgment which is the careful, painstaking work of the reporting judge acting offspring for a committee, and it's a consensus judgment, and obviously the other members of the court are going to be involved, the wingman, the SSR will be involved, but it's going to be a consensual judgment. And some of the, some of the sharp corners may have got a little rounded in the process. So what do you get by adding an advocate general into the mix? Well, I suggest to you the first thing that you get is that you create a situation in which there were two members of the court, that is both the reporting judge and the advocate general, who have a responsibility for ensuring that the case is shepherded through the court in a sensible and efficient way. So that also provides a significant safety net just in terms of case handling, because you've got two people whose job it is to make sure that that case stays on a sensible set of rails. This is probably the moment when I should very gently emphasize that every case has an advocate general. Not just the cases that have opinions. It's not that you decide, look at cases, and when you think that case needs an opinion, you look for an advocate general to whom to give the case. It's the opposite way around. Every case has an advocate general. Of the cases that you have as an advocate general, a number will now be decided without an opinion. If the court decides that it is sufficiently informed and it doesn't need an opinion, there won't be an opinion. But there was an advocate general in the case. Having an advocate general in there in parallel with the reporting judge does mean that you have a check that the court has got the measure of the case that it understands what needs to be devoted to the case in terms of resources as a function of the difficulty of the case, also how the case fits into the overall pattern, whether there are any bear traps and any particular problems that we should be aware of, what is the level of difficulty of the case? You know, they're not all equally difficult or equally easy. Like humans, they come in all shapes and sizes. And therefore also, what is the appro appropriate quantity of resources to be devoted to a particular case? And that normally gets translated into a kind of shorthand that there are three questions on housekeeping that will have to be settled for each case. What size of court does it go to? What's the formation? Is this a tiddly little case that can be done by a chamber of three? At the other end, is it a case that needs the grand chamber or exceptionally needs the full court? Or does it fall in between the two extremes and is it a chamber of five? First question. Second question, does this case need a hearing? I know that's a horrifying question that I should be asking as a question, but for the court, it's a real question. The court only has hearings if hearings are deemed 
to add value to what the court already knows. So the question, should this case have a hearing, is actually a very serious question. And you have, if you want to have a hearing, you have to show your colleagues what will be the value added from having a hearing in the case. And the question which perhaps concerns the AG most nearly, should there be an Advocate General's opinion in this case? The default value is, by the way, that there will be an opinion. The court has specifically to decide not to have an opinion. Having said that, you know, whether there is an opinion, well, the, the test that's there in the statute in Article 20 is, is fine, you know. If there isn't a new question of law, then you don't have an opinion. Ladies and gentlemen, sadly to me, invisible ladies and gentlemen, but ladies and gentlemen, yeah, I'm sure, even without seeing you, I know you're all good lawyers. Let me give you a case and let me give you 20 minutes. I guarantee you will be able to find some new question of law. You'll, you'll find something in there which is new, particularly if I put it to you as a challenge, find a new question of law. You will excavate a new question of law. So if we were actually to apply that test, there would be an opinion in every case. So the test that is actually applied is a sort of nuanced version of the test. And it goes more like, is there a real new question of law, which is an important new question of law, which is going to have an impact on the case law in the future and which it's worth spending the extra time on? That's not exactly the words of the statute, but it is more or less the practical test that is applied by the court. So when you do have an opinion and you have the Advocate General involved, I mean, what's the difference between what the reporting judge is doing, which is presumably thinking for the court and helping it, right? And what the Advocate General is doing? Well, the first and most obvious comment to make is that the Advocate General is an individual voice, a very individual voice in a world which is a consensual committee world. The Advocate General's opinion is a counterpoint to the consensual judgment of the court. It's also, and I'm going to use the word cute in its American sense, it's also a very cute little device for having two bites at the cherry. The Advocate General's opinion is going to be constructed out of the same written and oral pleadings as the judgment. But because it is an opinion rather than a binding judgment at first instance, that enables the court having taken account of the opinion, to proceed to use the same material in order to construct a judgment, which is obviously a much quicker process than having pleadings, first instance judgment, appeal, pleadings in the appeal, judgment on appeal. So it is a very neat little trick for making sure that within the same framework of procedure, you get two goes at the case. Holding on to that idea as a thought, what then is an Advocate General's opinion? Well, I'll tell you something. If you really want to wind an Advocate General up and make them splutter with indignation, you will just suggest to one of us that it's like a judgment at first instance. You will like the blue touch paper and then I hope you'll stand back because all of us will splutter if you say that. And we will splutter for good reason. I reckon that if I were writing, if I had been writing first instance judgments, I could have got out 
two or three judgments easily in the time that it took me to write one decent, medium sized opinion. And if we're thinking a big opinion, something like Risembrano or Farrell or the LGBTI case in October of uh, 2019 or the Visegrad cases, same date, that, that was certainly about the same as the work that would have gone into four or five first instance judgments. I'm not going even to talk about the opinion that I did on the EU Singapore free trade agreement to which I lost six months of my life. I could have written a lot of first instance judgments in that amount of space. But you're not trying to write a first instance judgment when you write an opinion, because the job of the first instance judge is basically to get through his caseload. So he has a look at the case and he sizes it up and he says, yes, well, this is a case about this. And I think the answer to the first point is this. And the answer to the second point is that. And the answer to the third point is the other. And if I've got it wrong, go and appeal it and the boys and girls upstairs will do something about it next case. I, you know, a good first instance judge, I, I'm not parodying that, a good first instance judge is cracking on with their caseload. And they're not going down various very interesting little side alleys because they need to get that case out and then move on to the next case. And the appellate jurisdiction is precisely there in order, if required, to alter what was done at first instance. That's not what an opinion is about. An opinion, here I'm going to use an image for you. Luxembourg is a very beautiful little country of which I'm inordinately fond, and I'm proud to be a citizen now of Luxembourg. Luxembourg is a country that is full of castles. One of the best known castles is the castle at Vianden, which is an enormous rambling edifice, very, very impressive, very much visited. Now, you could make a model of the Anden Castle with Lego. And if you were reasonably good with Lego, by the time you'd finished, your model would look roughly like Vianden. I mean, you know, you'd be able to tell it was Vianden. You would see the bridge and then the central, the path going up, and then the central keep and then the tower and then the flanking wall with its little turrets. And so, you know, you, you'd look at it and if you knew what Vianden looked like, you'd say, yep, that's a model of Vianden. Not very beautiful, but it's a model of Vianden. That is what the reporting judge is doing when he uses the prefabricated building blocks, these formulaic phrases with which ECJ judgments are constructed in order to put together rather clunkily, dare I say, a new judgment. It is like Lego building blocks to make a model of Vianden. What is the Advocate General doing? Well, the lucky Advocate General is like a good photographer with a really good digital camera. And the mission to take the best photo of Vianden Castle, best being de defined as the photo that expresses the way that the photographer sees Vianden. So, I mean, that gives the photographer a lot of space. It gives the photographer the right to choose the time of day or evening for the shot. When in the year, 
Do we want a winter photo of the Andon or do we want it with green leaves bursting out all over the place? How are we going to frame the Andon? What kind of angle are we using? Are we doing full wide angle? Are we were probably not doing real telephoto, but you know, where in between are we doing this? All right, what about exposure? Exposure and time. Do we want, what depth of field do we want? Do we want a filter? You, you, get, the, you get the point, you know, you're, you've got so many variables in there that you can play with in order to create the perception of the Amden Castle. And it is, it should be, a real work of art, a real artistic creation, which expresses what you wanted to say about the Andon. And a good opinion expresses what its author wanted to say about that particular piece of law. Now, don't get me wrong, there are, there's a very, very wide range of cases that you write about. Advocates General, each Advocate General has an 11th of the entire caseload of the court. And as long as I was serving at the court, it was a kind of mantra that the Advocates General were not specialists in particular areas. Everyone did everything. It was certainly true that some Advocates General had a particular love for particular areas. Juliana Kokot and I used to fight over who got the environmental cases, but we didn't get all of them. Uh, some of our other colleagues also got environmental cases, for example. And then there were certain cases that none of us wanted, but we all had to do our fair share of them. I think possibly the ones about close clearance recovery of customs duties would come into that category. They didn't tend to set the Thames on fire or make our hearts sing within our breasts but we did our share of them. And not every opinion leads itself to the full viand and photo treatment. You know, some of them, you look at it and you say, okay, I need to do a workmanlike job with this. What do I need to do with it? Why did the court want to have an opinion? Why did the court think an opinion was necessary? Answer, because there's this, this, and this issue, right? In we go, let's try and understand what we're doing. Now, I will also say, I think I probably should say, speaking against the background of having a chairman who is intellectual property and speaking in a context which is normally an intellectual property context, uh, I should say I'm a little embarrassed to speak in such a context because I am not an IP lawyer. And uh, I have written opinions on IP topics but I don't have a background in IP, and yet I wrote on IP. And that's a fact of life because of the distribution system for AG's work. Interestingly, it's also a fact of life on the judge's side of the house. Although if you have a difficult IP case, you may try to steer that case towards a judge who is strong in that particular area to act as reporting judge, what you cannot do is to pack the court with other judges who also know about that topic. And the reason that that doesn't work, and it's a very interesting area of, not exactly conflict, but just sort of mutual incomprehension and difference between the way of thinking about judges' role in the common law tradition and the tradition of the juge legal the Gesetzliche Richter. Um, if you are thinking common law, you don't see anything wrong if you have, for example, a case which involves maritime law and the hague Visby rules in trying to make sure that you give that case in the Court of Appeal a bench that has some vague idea what the hague Visby rules might be about. I mean, that just seems sensible. You know, you want your judges to know about the area. The way that the rules on organising, on fixing the formation of court 
work in the CJU is the exact antithesis of being able to pack the court with lawyers who know about the hague Lisby rules. Thus, there is a list which specifies the order of names for judges to sit in the Grand Chamber. And if a case goes to the Grand Chamber, the president will sit. There will be a president and a vice president. There will be a couple of presidents of chambers of five. There's a rota for that. And then, of course, the reporting judge will have to sit. And then the other judges will sit in accordance with which are the next names on the list. And it is inconceivable that you would upset that in order to make sure either that you had the judge who was of the nationality of the country from which the case came, or that you would upset it in order to bring in someone who wouldn't otherwise have been part of the formation, but who happens to be the person at the court who knows all about this subject. The only exception to that is where you can see that two cases should be heard together. And there, there is a special little provision in the rules of procedure that allows you to override the rota and make sure that it's the same formation for those two cases. But otherwise, the rota is absolutely sacred. It's the juge legal. And so you can, in the interests of knowing who your lawful judge is, you can end up with a situation in which a court, the court is deciding a particular point in a particular area, not with its A team of people who really, really, really know about that subject, but instead with a group of people who know rather less about the subject, not to put it in a, any different way. I want to, to wrap this up in order to leave you room for questions. Uh, so I'm going to give you another picture for the role of the Advocate General. Imagine that you have an army which is marching along and it comes to a place where there's a clearing and there are three possible paths. In theory, they're in hostile territory and night is falling. And it's not that clear which path they should take. So sensibly enough, they make camp for the night. And the general of the army, we'll call him Jack, sends for an old friend of his, Tom. They were at staff college together. And then they took different routes in the military. Uh, Jack took the standard careers path and he's now ended up as a general. And Tom was always the sort of person who was interested in military intelligence. So he went down that path and he's absolutely at the top of his profession in military intelligence. And Jack asked Tom to come in and he says, look, you know, I, I need a feel for which way to go. I've got to make a choice as to which of these three routes I take. Can you please go out and have a look for me? I really want to know what you think about this. Sure, no problem. Tom goes out and scouts. He comes back shortly before dawn. We, we hope they give him a nice hot meal and, you know, make a lot of him. But he's been out all night. And Jack says eagerly, well, you know, tell me, what's it look like? Well, says Tom, the left-hand path, it looks very nice to start with. It looks very nice for 200 metres till you get to the bushy bit down there. And as soon as you go around the corner, it's a marsh. It's completely boggy ground. We'll never get the heavy armour through there. Forget it. You know, just, just forget that path. It's not going to take you anywhere. The central path, 
again it looks reasonably nice and it goes on looking nice except you know it starts going through a gorge and and gradually these sort of rock walls start closing in on you and you know i have a really bad feeling about that place i can't put my finger on it except i didn't see that much but i heard one or two things i i heard something that might have been pebbles shifting under somebody's foot i i heard enough that i really don't like that place and it obviously objectively is a place that if they were to stage an ambush they would cut us to pieces all they'd need to do is to get us well and truly into the gorge and then they block the front end they block the rear end and they carve us up in between i do not recommend taking the middle road and jack looks at him if there's only one road left and that didn't look too nice either yes 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 i know the start of the right hand road is not anything to write home about it's mucky it's mucky but it's passable it will just be slow but it's not intrinsically difficult and it only goes on being mucky for about 400 meters and after that it really gets a lot better and it's running across open country it's not ambush territory you can see what you're doing and once you're out of the mucky bit you can even go fairly fast my money would be on the right hand path now very obviously tom is not the general jack is the general jack is entirely free not to follow tom's advice but if Jack is a wise general, he probably will follow the advocate general. He'll probably follow what Tom has suggested. I'm going to leave matters there and I'm going to invite you, if you would like to ask questions, to feel free to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was fascinating and insightful. And I think that I may speak for many of us because many people, especially academics, like to be very critical of the court of justice and of uh, some specific age opinions. But uh, what you have given us is some much needed context as well as to how challenging it is actually for a court which is dealing with a multitude of legal systems and 24 legal languages to kind of add content to what was initially a compromise within the legislative uh, level. So it is quite a daunting task. And I think that uh, we may disagree with one judgment on another, but I think that it, uh, as a project is absolutely brilliant, if not inspirational as well. And thank you so much for the talk. That was very interesting. And I, I, I can already see a round of mute applauses to you, uh, blind applauses, sadly, but uh, I cannot see any other outcome than this one. Uh, we are, anyone willing to ask questions, you can use the Q&A function and I will be reading them. And I will also making the question available uh, for all the members of the audience to see them as well. Uh, first, I would like to give the floor uh, to Professor Kretschmer, who will be asking the second question. And then I will abuse my position as chair as well to ask another question, <laughs> if that's OK. Yeah, we have many, many questions. You know, that, that was wonderful, Eleanor. Um, and, and we, many of us are tempted, you know, to, to ask, um, you know, we have so rarely uh, an opportunity that uh, we can lift the lid on, on this mysterious, mysterious institution and how it's possible that, you know, um, a coherent jurisprudence uh, growth out of um, legal, legal building blocks. Um, but I would like to ask a first question really, which is a little bit more political. I know you are involved in this um, 
uh, the famous Sharpston appeal, but uh, there, there's implicit in, in the work of the court um, the need to maintain le legitimacy. So the, the source of the court was, you know, assume a dispute settlement body, um, and there were divergent national interests. And in the field of copyright law, we did a couple of studies where we tried to investigate whether the opinions, the, 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 the opinions, um, the written observations by, by member states, whether they have any bearing on the, on the reasoning of, of the court. Um, and we found that on the whole, the, 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 the judgments of the court go with the uh, opinions of the member states collectively understood. So, so the, the court tries to maintain legitimacy um, in some ways. You know, it, it cannot go on 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 an entirely separate path. So, I would be interested how that feels on the inside. You know, some advocate generals um, cite the, the 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 submissions by member states, the written observations. Others do it very little. Um, um, some member states are cited much more often than others. Um, as in, in in writing an opinion, do you take into account, you know, that you have to maintain legitimacy in a very complex kind of uh, uh, continent. That's a very nice question, Professor. Thank you for that. I think the first observation to make is that the member states have the unfettered right to tell the courts what they think the answer should be to a particular case. They have the right to get in there and express their opinion. And the corollary of that right is that if they don't get in there and express their opinion, and then they don't like what we did afterwards, after the event, we tend to be rather unsympathetic because, you know, if they didn't explain that they had an issue with something, how are we meant to know? We're not psychic. So it follows also from that, that if they do intervene and they lodge written observations, of course, we're going to read what they've said. Now, what they say, first of all, they don't always all sing on the same side of the case. Sometimes I can think of a number of cases that I did in the final part of my time at the court where, you know, there were five member states involved and three of them were on one side and then two were on the other side. And halfway through the case, the sort of the alignment shifted a bit. So in questions one and two, the setup was like that. And then in questions three and four, the, the, it shuffled slightly. So it, the member states is not a monolithic position. You know, the member states, for a whole variety of reasons, may have nuanced views as to what they would like the court to do in any particular case. And they are also less and more good at explaining what it is that they wanted to say. I mean, there are some member states who you can tell they're upset, but exactly what they think you should do is maybe not quite so clear. The next thing I'm going to say is that in terms of the amount of citing that you do as an advocate general, citing what was in the written observations, when I first went to the court in 2006, you had a certain amount of space and freedom to write as long or as short as you liked. And if, if you felt, given that there would no longer be a published report for the hearing, if you felt that it would be helpful for everyone to know briefly who had said what in terms of how the parties had lined up, then you wrote, you know, three or four paragraphs which said on the first question, the such, such, such and such, such and such and such and such governments suggest that the answer should be this for these reasons. In, on the other hand, uh, such and such a government and the commission think the answer should be something different. And, and you would do that. And indeed, I sometimes got feedback from, from academic friends that, you know, this was a helpful characteristic because it meant that you in the scientific world that one had a clearer idea of who'd backed which horses and then we got then we got into difficulties because this is a story about multilingualism in the court because the court got very worried about the number of pages that it was translating 
uh, requirements for translation were becoming more and more uh, boundless with the volume of work and then the AG's opinions and the judgments and I you know only a certain number of translators on the budget and going over a million pages of translation every year and you know I mean you you can't go on squeezing more translation out of a limited resource and there were all sorts of discussions inside the court as to how we could deal with this you know maybe the AG's opinions would only be translated in every other case we all looked at each other and said what <laughs> and so there was then put in place an agreement which is still there which is that the AG's I'm going to put quotes around the word voluntarily the AG's voluntarily agreed that they would write to a rolling average over three months of a maximum of 40 pages per opinion as calculated in the draft spacing of the court okay which comes out at about 28 and a half pages of final text now i mean all rules of thumb are ridiculous because you can write an opinion in a customs case that maybe takes you 18 pages you cannot possibly write Ruth Sambrano in 40 pages. I mean, you can't do it. You can't do any big opinion in 40, case, 40 pages if you're going to do it justice. And so what you end up doing is you end up robbing some opinions in order to put pages into the piggy bank, which you can then spend on the bigger cases. But one of the casualties of that has been this nice habit of narrating what the member states say, what the parties say, because a lot of the time you simply cannot afford the extra space that all of that would take. Now, if there is a particular argument which you have to deal with or that caught your fancy and you could see it caught the court's fancy, but you think it's wrong, then you are going to flag that argument up and explain it and then reject it and explain why you reject it because that's part of shaping your advice on the case but you are no longer i think going to produce as a kind of regular service this brief synthesis of here is here are the positions that everyone adopted because if you do do that then you probably are going to have to be rather more superficial in your treatment of some of the actual issues and i mean you know for what it's worth i would always feel that you should put your efforts and your pages into the analysis if you have to choose rather than into the narrative of this is what everyone said i mean you know that may be a wrong choice by the way but that's the choice that i tended to make thank you Thank you. My question is actually slightly related to Martin's, and I would like to go back to the idea of CJEU decisions being a result of consensus and how you contrast that with uh, the position of the Advocate General, where they actually have more, let's put it in a way, with some poetic life and more freedom in approaching a given case and giving their opinion. And, we also see because of that, because, for example, there is no speech or opinion from an individual judge, we often see courts having resort to AG opinions as a means of clarifying a part of a judgment which may not be as clear or as at least to try and get some additional context. And my question was, is actually going at the heart of a, a metaphor that you gave that I found it very appropriate, which is the idea of Biden and giving uh, the AG giving it the full void in treatment in deciding how to approach an issue and uh, with the different kinds of discourses which can be broached. And my question specifically is, uh, we know there are many different kinds of methods of interpreting legal text. And what one AG may decide to uh, do a more literal interpretation, for example, which I would find problematic when we consider there are 24 different languages and all text is being translated. And even the actual statutory language is not the same depending on the kind of country that we're talking about. And we have other AGs going for a more consequentialist 
if you or philo teleological approach in their opinions. So my question would be essentially, what makes an AG to decide for one particular matter of in uh, interpretation or another? Well, I think we all know that the court is not going to go with just a literal reading of the text. So if you if you do the literal reading of the text and you stop there, I would I'm afraid to say I don't think you've done your job. Uh, the court is going to look at the literal meaning and it's going to look at the context. It's going to be teleological. There is also, by the way, a very excellent reason for not sticking with the literal meaning, and you yourself touched on it just now in asking the question, because you have equally authentic texts in all the different languages. It's true that if you have a, let's imagine you have a directive which was drafted in 1997. It's entirely true that the Czech text of that directive we all know is going to be a translation because we all know that the Czech Republic joined in 2004. And so we know that when the directive was being promulgated in 1997, whatever else they were thinking about, they weren't thinking about the meaning of the Czech text. So maybe you would look at the Czech text, put that to the side, and you would look at the text of the directive, assuming you could read them, in the various languages that were official languages in 1997. Now, I mean, in my cabinet, we used to pride ourselves on being a reasonably cultured, literate, li linguistic cabinet. And when you've said all of that, you know, we couldn't muster as many as half the languages. And also we had major overlaps because, you know, all of us had French, a lot of us had German, some of us had Portuguese, some had, some had, you know, I mean, we, 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 we weren't efficient. We didn't sort of say, okay, you do those four languages, you do those four, right? Uh, but even as soon as you started looking at the texts in different languages, you discovered that the texts weren't identical. And so you also realized that there would be no point at all in making your interpretation of the text dependent upon whether there was a comma at the end of the fifth line of the second paragraph of Article 2, Paragraph 4. Because I, there was no way you were going to find a comma in the same place in all the language versions. Some of them might have no commas, some might have three, some might have two. You know, the French one might have four in places you'd never thought of. I mean, you know, you, you can't do it like that. And indeed, there are some references where the whole reference has come to the court because there's a text which is out of line with other texts. If I were grabbing an example right off the top of my head, it would be the uh, Emirate Airlines case, which was a reference from Germany about flights departing from an airport. And Emirate Airlines, as the name implies, is not what is called a community carrier. It's a carrier from a third country. And the liability under the air transport passenger, air passenger regulation is more limited for a third country carrier than for an EU carrier. An EU carrier, it doesn't matter whether the flight is going out of the EU or coming into the EU, the air passenger regulation applies. If it's a non-community carrier, it applies if it's a flight that's leaving the EU, but not a flight coming in the other way. And the case, this case involved a passenger who had a return ticket, caught a flight from a German airport to, from memory, the Philippines. I think it was Manila. Outbound flight was fine. Return flight got horrendously delayed. He applied for compensation. And he, obviously, Emirates Airlines said, what are you talking about? We're not an EU carrier. And it happened on the return flight. And he said, oh, but I had a return ticket. And it was all the single flight. And I left, I left from an airport in the EU, and it was all the single journey, and therefore you're still liable. 
And the argument wouldn't, wouldn't have ever, forgive the pun, got off the ground if you'd been looking at the English text or the French text. But if you were looking at the German text as the German court was, actually the argument wasn't so impossible. It was sufficiently not impossible that actually the referring court thought he was probably right, but they made a reference. And that case had an AG's opinion, you'll gather my opinion, because I can remember that amount about the case and I'm not an encyclopedia. Uh, it had an AG's opinion and it had a chamber of five judges painstakingly clawing its way through the regulation and the structure and the teleology of the regulation as well as the wording in order to come to the conclusion, sadly for this gentleman, that no, he wasn't covered by the regulation traveling with a non-community carrier on a return flight coming into the community, which had started in Manila, a third country. But I mean, that whole thing had to be unpacked and looked at, and it couldn't be done on the basis of the literal text, because the literal text simply wasn't the same text in all the languages. Thank you. Fascinating example as well. Uh, we have a, a good number of questions, and we will do our best to uh, tackle as many as we can. And as part of that effort, uh, I'm, I'm actually merging two questions from the audience, which are largely related to what we were just talking about, which is essentially, uh, do you think it would help an AG in, in her role if the EU system admitted amicus briefs? Why do you think the EU court system doesn't have them? And the other slightly related uh, question is, do you think dissenting opinions should be allowed? Uh, thanks to the, or to the originators of both those questions. I don't just think the Advocate General would be helped by having amicus briefs. I think the court would be helped by having amicus briefs. That's easy. Now, we do actually, in a funny sense, have some amicus briefs, but only if there was an amicus brief in the national court before the reference was made. So, for example, I can think of two cases involving Palestinian refugees, cases called Bolbol and El Cot, which came as references to the court from Hungarian jurisdictions and where the UNHCR had got involved before the national court. And because they were involved before the national court, they were entitled to follow the case to the Court of Justice. And as you'd expect from UNHCR, they did in fact put in what amounted to amicus briefs. I mean, they weren't on one side or other of the case, they were there as amicus. And very useful, by the way, excellent the briefs were. But we do not have a separate procedure for admitting amicus briefs before the CJEU. The argument that is usually made is the old boring argument about floodgates. Personally, I don't buy it, but I know that a number of my colleagues have bought it for years and I'm not optimistic that it's going to change anytime soon. But there really are moments when it would be very, very useful to have an amicus brief or to have the possibility of permitting an amicus brief in a particular type of case. As for the argument about dissenting judgments, it depends which tradition you're from. If you're from a tradition which has dissents, you think it's cuckoo not to have dissents. You can't understand why if it's a big court, a big grown-up court, it can't have dissents. And you point to the fact that, for example, the Strasbourg court has dissents. And if Strasbourg can have dissents, why can't Luxembourg have dissents? I mean, it's a very well worn and repeated argument. If you are from a tradition in which the Supreme Court speaks with a single voice, you are horrified at the idea that there should be cracks in the edifice. And you also say, and I understand this argument, I don't know if I entirely buy it, but I certainly understand it, 
you also say, look, often a national court makes a reference to the Court of Justice on a topic that is fairly complicated, sensitive, difficult, maybe politically hot. If the national court gets back from Luxembourg a judgment which is a single text judgment, then it's clear to everyone what we, the Court of Justice of the European Union, think about this case. This is the answer. This is what we have said. This is the answer. Now apply it. And I mean, that's easy. If I say that's easy enough for the national judge, it gives the national judge a clear message. This is what the Court of Justice is ruling. And the people who make this argument then go on to say, just imagine, they say in horror, just imagine, supposing in those circumstances, there were to be a majority view of the court and then a minority opinion, which is what the government had wanted, but not what we said was the right view of the law by the majority. Just imagine how difficult that would make life for the national judge. There are also, by the way, other arguments that are made which relate, which are technical arguments, which relate yet again to volume of work, volume of drafting, the translation burden, and so on and so on, right? I mean, they're also out there. But I find the argument that I've just outlined, the one about what would be the position of the national judge with a difficult case where the majority judgment said what the government didn't want to hear, and the minority judgment said what the government did want to hear, actually a rather more interesting and thoughtful argument. Thank you. This is now a question from Professor Jim Murdoch here at Glasgow. He's asking, could such a role be usefully used by the other Strasbourg court, at least in respect of the new procedure of advisory opinions requested by domestic superior courts? If so, has this been discussed to your knowledge during joint meetings of both European courts? Uh, I was, I'm not going to say excluded, shall we say I wasn't invited to. The most recent meeting that there was between the two courts during the time that I was still at the court. Uh, most of the meetings before, in fact, all the meetings before that I did attend. And I do not remember it being discussed at any of those meetings. I think that in a sense, the Strasbourg answer might be, since we all are free to express dissenting views, part of why the court has advocates general isn't necessary. I'm not sure that's actually a totally good answer, but it's certainly one that I've, that I've heard. I think also that there's a kind of bigger question behind this, which is what do you use your advocates general for? And how much pressure do you put on them? And do you perceive their job as being really to get out there and try and think and be helpful about thinking, my image of the scout, right? Or do you regard them as kind of useful additional cannon fodder to you know to get on with stuff i'm going here i declare an interest of course as an advocate general because i'm about to speak about a procedure that none of us liked all right so you can apply a discount factor to what i'm going to say in recent the recent two three years right the court has increasingly made use of reasoned orders in appeals in IP cases, in trademark cases, to dismiss such appeals as either manifestly inadmissible or manifestly ill-founded. And it has used a terribly clever new technique, which consists of getting the Advocate General to do the work. So what happens is the formation of judgment opens the drafting of the order by saying this is an appeal from the judgment of the general court right and that occupies two paragraphs and then the third paragraph says 
on such and such a date, Advocate General so and so gave the following view, open quotation marks. You then insert what is a mini, 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 six or seven page only, opinion stroke judgment by the Advocate General, which goes through the entire appeal and in a very short compass explains why parts of it are manifestly inadmissible, parts of it are manifestly ill-founded, and other parts of it yet are probably manifestly inadmissible, but in any event are manifestly ill-founded. So the whole thing should go away. And you get to the end of the Advocate General's reasoning and you close the quotation marks and you open a new paragraph and you say, for the reasons given by the Advocate General, this appeal is dismissed. We'll stop. Now, what actually are you doing when you do that? Well, I can give you the pragmatic answer. You're saving a lot of judges' time. And judges' time is precious and valuable. And if you, it's also great for the statistics because you can get rid of those cases very quickly. And if you can get rid of those cases quickly, then you are buying time to put into the piggy bank which can be used to deliberate much more complicated cases. And that must be to use the classification system made famous by 1066 and all that. That must be a good thing, capital G, capital T, because you are managing to get more time to deliberate difficult cases. But let's look at what's happening at the other end of the telescope. What's the AG doing and what's the court doing? And it is really a little bit curious because these are not cases which require an AG to go out there and think great thoughts about the future direction of EU law. On the contrary, right? They're very much bread and butter, tried and tested. We all know the answer, and this is no. If the AG is in fact deciding the case, then they are doing something which according to primary EU law, they shouldn't be doing because they're not meant to decide, they're meant to advise. If on the other hand, the members of the formation are nevertheless, despite the fact that the AG has just done all the work, they are also all doing all the work as well, then we're wasting a lot of resources. Because if they're going to crawl all over the file and the AG has just crawled all over the file, why on earth were we getting the AG to crawl over the file in one of these cases when they should have been writing a, an opinion in the difficult case? And uh, as I say, the AGs are not thrilled about these cases. I, really, I don't think that's any particular secret. And I certainly remember getting extremely annoyed when I was in the middle of writing a difficult grand chamber opinion, and I really had my head down in that, and suddenly one of these wretched little beasts trotted up, and I was meant to stop doing the grand chamber case and turn that around in 10 days. It's got a very, very tight time limit. You will get this turned around and out within 10 days because we're trying to gain time on the statistics. And, you know, I was with child with the grand chamber case. I needed to get on with the grand chamber case. I was just in the middle of, of trying to think it through. And I had to put the whole thing down, you know, on ice, sketching notes to myself, frantically tried not to forget particular ideas and loose ends, and then deal with this completely, forgive me, piffling trademark case which really wasn't worth powder and shot, but the appeal was there and needed to be got rid of. Now, I, I mean, I've deliberately put it in strong terms. I invite you to apply a discount factor because I've told you that I didn't like this procedure, all right? Once you've applied your discount factor, still ask yourself the question, what is going on here? And is this a good use of AG's time? Thank you. We have a question here from uh, Professor Estelle Declare 
Uh, it's a bit long, so I will do my best in, in some classic CJU fashion to rephrase it and make it a, a, little, a little bit a bit shorter while retaining its uh, spirit. But, let's put it by, its, by its fourth question, the National Court essentially wish, wishes to ask. Yeah, exactly. So let me try and do my best here. So uh, Prof Professor De Declare did some recent empirical work on the, uh, that's in the context of copyright, but she was looking into the possible influences of attorney generals. And she uh, found that uh, they tend to be most influenced by academic literature uh, in their own language or in the language of their legal secretaries. So that seems to be skewing towards uh, the uh, opinions being referencing mostly uh, literature in English, French, and German. So, so she's asking uh, whether you would see that as a, as a problem that needs addressing by the court. I'm going to begin, and I apologize for the bluntness of it, by ask, answering a question with a question, how would the court go about addressing it? You know, we don't have, we, we have the people we work with. There may be a wonderful article in Lithuanian about the recent case law of the court on Islamic headscarves, but I can't access it. I'd be very lucky even to know it existed. I might uh, get it, pick it up through Academia EU, maybe. And if I did, I wouldn't be able to read it. And I would not have, I mean, all of this is speaking as though I was still working at the court, all right? But I wouldn't have the time or the ability to read it. I didn't have a referendaire who read Lithuanian. The most that could conceivably have happened would have been that my referendaire would have gone along to find a referendaire who worked for the Lithuanian judge and who was probably the only Lithuanian referendaire in those chambers, because even the judge wouldn't necessarily have four Lithuanians working with him. He'd probably have uh, two French mother tongue, one Belgian and one Lithuanian, right? So my the maximum that could happen would be that my referendaire went and found the one Lithuanian referendaire in the Lithuanian cabinet, and my referendaire, speaking French to the Lithuanian referendaire, would say to the Lithuanian colleague, my advocate general has turned up what looks like a big, fat, juicy article about the Islamic veil, but it's in Lithuanian. And there would be a pause. And my referendaire would say, if I gave you a bottle of wine, could you just tell me, I mean, could you read it? and very, very, very summary form, just tell me what they're saying. I mean, do they like the decision in Beta or do they think it's rubbish? It would just be nice to know. And if they think it's rubbish, which bit of the judgment do they criticize? But I mean, that would be the outside edge of what you could do. And you probably would never know that the article was there. And I, I mean, I'm also going to make the shameful confession. There are a number of languages that I read, but I don't skim the available literature to see whether there's something out there that would be interesting because I simply don't have the time. I didn't have the time at the court and I'm amused to note that I don't have the time now either. So, you know, although in theory, if there were an article in, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, Dutch, maybe Swedish, just about, as well as French and English and German. Maybe, in theory, I could look at it, but in practice, I can't. My reading speed in German is much, much slower than my reading speed in, in, in French. And my reading speed in Spanish and Italian and Portuguese is fine, but I probably don't have time to go and look for it. I mean, this is a... You know, the research is absolutely right that it's skewed. Your, your, your empirical findings are entirely correct. The problem is there's nothing that the court is going to do about that. There is a research division within the court. There's Rishesh and Doc. And in the very, very old days of the court, Rishesh and Doc had spare time to go and look for interesting articles in their own languages. 
Those days are well and truly past. Now, when research and doc are asked to do something, they're asked to help with filtering appeals. They're asked to help with making the recommendations as to which trademark cases can be dealt with by these, with these orders. They're asked to do comparative research notes, except that we no longer ask them to do research notes which cover all the member states because there's never the time and the resources to do that. So even if it's a big case and you'd love to know what is the position on this in all the member states, you end up with a sub selection. OK, we need a we need a common law member state. We need two civilians. We need one of the Eastern European. No, maybe two of the Eastern European member states. Wait a minute. Do we think do, what, wait a minute? What about Southern Europe? Um, do we take the Italian? Do we think that the Spanish or the Portuguese might be more representative? Ah, what do we do? Right. That there is not the ability, there are not the resources, and there is not the time. One of the things that has struck me very, very, very forcibly is what has happened to the workload at the court between 2006 when I joined and 2020 when I left. It's not that when I joined in 2006, we sat around and we talked about golf and crocheting. We didn't. But there was time, a bit more time to breathe. And in those days, I asked when I wrote an opinion as an absolute, absolute practice, I got all the members of my team to review that opinion. So even a, a quote small case, I wrote the opinion with a referendaire. And then the other referendaire, plus anyone who was a visitor in chambers, everyone else within the team critiqued the draft. By the time I was leaving the court, we only did that for the blockbuster cases because we could not afford the time to do a full review by the three other referendaires of a smaller case. A smaller case, we would pick one referendaire and say, please would you read this as a fresh pair of eyes? Oh, and if we've got a stagiaire as well, great, could you read it as well? Now, think a little bit about what that means in terms of investment of time and what it tells you, you know, in terms of the way that a, a frankly a perfectionist advocate general found herself working. I couldn't afford to ask my whole team to review everything that was going out over my name anymore. The total review was only for the real big, big blockbuster cases. For the, and I think the only five, the only five judge case that got a block got the full review in probably the last two or three years I was at the court were the Visegrad cases and they were false grand chamber cases they were they were grand chamber cases but the court had deliberately hidden them in a chamber of five in order to try to make them look smaller except that when you looked at the composition of the chamber of five you discovered that accidentally the president of the court happened to be sitting in it But that was the only, they were the only, I think I'm right, in, my memory is right, that was the only case involving a chamber of five rather than the grand chamber where we said we have to have a full or referendaire review. We just couldn't afford it anymore. Thank you. And it appears that I may have been only partially successful in my rephrasing. So my apologies if I fail to reflect the question to the entire extent, but members of the audience can have a look at it uh, in the Q&A section, the full version. Uh, other points that were raised while we were answering, uh, just uh, for note, uh, maybe machine learning and machine learning translation might help, such as DeepL and other kinds of uh, systems which are available today. Already being really? used, already being used as much as it can be. But it doesn't, it doesn't 
help you to understand a badly expressed legal argument in uh, that was put together by a lawyer in a hurry trying to make a deadline. And hopefully we have time for one or more or two more questions and then we can uh, wrap up. Uh, so uh, just one question is from Sylvia. Uh, I'm not sure how I can pronounce your surname, so sorry about that, but Sylvia Stav Stavrido. And uh, she's asking whether a CJEU decision which does not follow or adopt an AG opinion, does that make it uh, or makes a completely different uh, decision? Does that make it uh, weak or less le legitimate? No, it just makes it less easy to understand. I mean, I think this is this is a variant on the on a very uh, frequently asked question. You know, how often are AGs followed, and does it matter if you're not followed, and so on? And it's actually, I think, rather difficult to tell, both from the inside and the outside, the extent to which the court has drawn on an AG's opinion from the wording, the express references to the AG. You do occasionally find, as the AG has said at point so and so, and you think, gosh, they've mentioned me. And then you go and look what they've referred to, and they've referred to the bit where you said two and two usually make four. So you then get a little less excited about the fact that they quoted you. Uh, if you find a judgment which has adopted the intellectual structure of the AG's opinion, but arrived at a different conclusion, the AG has certainly made their contribution. And by the way, you know, usually it's only at the end that the judgment diverges from where the AG was going. And probably the AG themselves wondered at the end, you know, do I turn left or do I turn right at the end of this story? So I wouldn't lose sleep on that. The answer is different, but, but I would feel that I'd done something useful to the court. As against that, there are some judgments which get to the same destination as the AG's opinion. And so they end up saying the same thing, but it would be a distortion of the English language to say that the court had followed the AG because the AG did that and the court did that. They just happened to end up at the same destination, but they didn't follow the AG. And, uh, you know, I mean, an example of maybe perhaps it's not quite as extreme as that, but an example of that might be Ruth Sambrano, where I wrote a very long, complicated opinion that got to a particular destination. And the court wrote a remarkably short judgment of seven paragraphs of reasoning, which also got to the destination. And I have absolutely no idea what that judgment means. And I'm the AG in the case. I have absolutely no idea. Various people have asked me to explain it and I put my hands up and I said, I'm sorry, I can't explain it because I have no idea. You know, you have a go, I have a go. Um, we all say maybe they were thinking about that. I, I, not a clue. Thank you. Now for our last question. Uh, this is from one of our LLM students. So Rob Tiwari, he's asking uh, that given that the opinion of the AG is delivered after the end of the hearing, does that not, doesn't it prejudice the parties if they are deprived of the right to respond or rejoin? Read the message sugar, which is the court's answer to that question. Uh, make up your own mind if you're convinced by it. Uh, but the AG, the AG is not a party, right? The, the right, of refer, right of reply relates to the ability to reply to the other party, and the AG is not a party. Now, you know, there is all the question marks over whether it is Strasbourg compliant to have a system with AGs. And in Cocklefisher I, which is a Strasbourg judgment, the Strasbourg court actually quoted an opinion of mine in which I had said that uh, there was a particular argument. And I'd said, if you want to address that argument and I've expressed a view about it, but if you want to address that argument, you should reopen the oral procedure and you should give the parties the option of saying whether they agree with me. 
And the Strasbourg court seized on this statement and said, there you are, it's perfectly clear that the Luxembourg procedure is fine because the AG herself was suggesting there that if the court wanted to, they could reopen the procedure. And so it's obviously not a theoretical possibility that they can reopen the procedure. Actually, they do reopen the procedure, perhaps. I will tell you as an AG, I sometimes had cases where I gave an opinion and then the party in whose favor I had not been promptly wrote into the courts and jumped up and down and said, you must reopen the procedure because the AG's got it completely wrong and inside out and upside down and back to front. And the first time this happened to me was in fact the second case I ever wrote an opinion in as an AG. So I was brand new kid on the block and I was very disconcerted and wondered whether I should be offering to commit ritual suicide on the front lawn, you know, I mean, if I was that bad at my new job. And a more experienced colleague said, Eleanor, be zen, calm down, it's okay. They try that trick. When they don't like what you wrote, some of them try that trick. It's all right, what you, all you have to do is you look at what they say, and then you write a note for the chamber that's deliberating it, explaining why what they've said is completely misconceived, and it's just that they don't like what you said, but you haven't misconstrued the, the text and you haven't misunderstood the file. And then you leave it to the courts and the court, believe me, the court's not going to reopen the procedure. And I gazed deep into the eyes of my senior colleague and I, took a deep breath and I said, thank you, I'll, I'll take your advice, I'll try that. And I did exactly what my colleague had suggested and it worked exactly as he, as he had said. I sent the note to the formation of judgment and in the case they said there was a, in the judgment, a record, there was a request to reopen the procedure. We, 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 we don't think there's any problem. We know, we understand the case. We don't see any need to reopen the, the procedure and we're not reopening it, the end. I mean, you know, that, that tells you all I can tell you in answer to what is a very reasonable question. Oh, well, thank you. That was our last question. We still uh, have a few questions, but I'm afraid we ran out of time. So my apologies for everyone who, great questions, but still we didn't manage to answer all of them. So my apologies for that. I hope you have all enjoyed as much as I surely have uh, this talk and especially the Q&A as well. It's always great to see this level of engagement and so many wide ranging issues being discussed. Thank you so much, Elena Strapson, for your time and uh, for your grace as well, and for your talk, with, which was really insightful. Uh, again, I would I would suggest a silent round of applause, and I, I'm sure that is uh, definitely happening uh, in our own homes uh, in these days. Uh, thank you so much. And just as thank a uh, reminder, I would uh, say that. Uh, we have our final lecture of this academic year uh, on the 24th of March with Dr. Emily Hudson from King's College London, when she will be talking about her uh, recently released book on empirical research relating to copyright defenses. So you, uh, anyone interested may want to sign up to our mailing list or follow us on Twitter or on the great blog where we will uh, release the details in, in due course. Well, uh, may, may I just say thank you for, for the questions. And I'm, I'm delighted to be doing this with Glasgow. And I'm just sorry that I'm not there in present, but thank you for your engagement. We are very sorry we can't give you a gift. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry we can't go and have a drink together with some of the nice students and go on with the questions and answers, but I'm sorry about that. And uh, I just took a very quick look at them. And the answer to one of those questions is I get got an immense amount of help from my very, very nice referendaire, my lawyers who worked with me. And, uh, you know, I mean, they were a great team. And we always said, I always said, and I always really meant, that the, the opinions 
were team Charleston opinions. They came out over my name and they were my opinion. And I, you know, I got stuck in and I did my bit, but they were a product of the team and they represented the collective professionalism and expertise of the team. And I would like to place that on record. Thank you so much. <laughs>